live NFL trivia every Wednesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge for a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. November 4th, 2007. It's week 9 of the NFL season, and we're at the Metrodome for this interconference matchup between the Minnesota Vikings and the San Diego Chargers. Now, there have been tens of thousands of games played in the history of the NFL. A lot of them get lost throughout history and the passage of time. If you have one moment from a game that lives on in history, and is still talked about years later, that's awfully impressive, especially for a regular season game. But what's remarkable about this game is that 15 years later, there are two such moments. Because you probably remember this game, even if you don't remember watching it live. Yes, the Vikings won this one 35-17. But two things stood out from this game. Number one, at the end of the first half, Ryan Longwell tried a 57-yard field goal. He missed it, and Antonio Cromartie returned it 109 yards for a touchdown, making it the longest missed field goal return in NFL history. It's a record that can be tied, but can never be broken, as it is impossible to go any further than Cromartie did. And number two, Adrian Peterson, a rookie running back, set the football world by storm on this day by running for 296 yards, which was and still is the NFL record for most rushing yards in a game. Two incredible moments that live on in NFL history, and both taking place within minutes of each other. But we're not here to talk about the guys that played in this game, because for today's story, we're here to talk about a guy that didn't play. Of the 528 yards of offense that the Vikings gained in this historic game, we're talking about a guy that gained none of those yards. We're talking about this man right here, wide receiver Troy Williamson. He did not play in this game, and he was fined by head coach Brad Childress because of it. And let's just say that the fine was controversial, to the point where Childress had to reverse course because of the negative public perception he got and because of the criticism he received, and to the point where Williamson legitimately wanted to fight his coach and knock him out because of the fine. Plenty of Vikings players have been fined before for a variety of reasons, but this has to be the worst reason of them all. This is the story behind the most controversial fine in the over 60 year history of the Vikings franchise. Before I talk about the incident in question, we need some context to understand just who Troy Williamson is, and how his career was going prior to the fine issued by head coach Brad Childress. When the Vikings drafted Williamson in the first round of the 2005 NFL Draft, they were looking for a guy who could replace Randy Moss who was now with the Oakland Raiders after his superb, albeit tumultuous, career in Minnesota. Instead, what they got was a massive bust and a massive disappointment. To this day, many consider Williamson to be one of the biggest busts in the history of the Vikings franchise, and he might even be the biggest bust. He did next to nothing as a rookie, recording just 24 receptions for 372 yards and two touchdowns, and having one catch or no catches in eight of his 14 games played that year. He followed that up in 2006 with, somehow, an even worse season, as even though he had 37 receptions for 455 yards, he didn't score a single receiving touchdown. There were 207 players in 2006 to score a receiving touchdown, including guys like Indianapolis Colts defensive tackle Dan Klecko. And yet, Troy Williamson, the number 7 pick in the 2005 NFL Draft, and the second receiver off the board, was not one of them. He was very clearly treading into bust territory, and through the first seven games of the 2007 season, he wasn't exactly doing anything to reverse that perception, as he had just nine catches for 159 yards. By this point, it seemed like Williamson was bound to go down as a massive whiff, and as one of the worst draft picks of all time. Williamson had hands of stone, caught less than 50% of the passes thrown his way, and more often than not, was a complete liability on the field. He dropped everything. I don't think I'm making any stunning revelation here when I say that it's kind of important to have your receiver be able to catch the football, and it's safe to say that Williamson could not do that. And I should note that by the time of this incident, the head coach of the Vikings was Brad Childress. The head coach at the time that Williamson was drafted in 2005 was Mike Tice, as Childress took over in 2006. This meant that Childress had no affiliation or ties whatsoever to Williamson. There was no connection there. And there were definitely some moments of tension where Childress's patience for Williamson and his inability to catch the football was wearing thin. After one game in 2006 against the San Francisco 49ers, where Williamson dropped just about everything thrown his way, 
children spoke of Williamson's struggles, saying that he just had to power through. He said, There is not a magic serum that you can inject in him. You've got to play on. You've got to play through. And that's the toughest thing sometimes. Keep in mind that Williamson dropped 11 passes in 2006, which is obviously not good, and will make any coach frustrated. And even though Childress praised Williamson during the 2007 offseason, noting a change in his demeanor, it didn't help matters much when both Williamson and the Vikings were struggling near the halfway point of the year. If the Vikings were going to turn their season around after a 2-5 start, and after losing 5 of their last 6 games, they were going to have to win this game against the San Diego Chargers, no doubt about it. Win this game, and be at 3-5 and five at the halfway point, and you can still realistically make the playoffs if you go on a hot streak. Lose this game, and at 2-6, and six, you're dead in the water. It was going to be an all-hands-on-deck situation. However, there was one hand who was not on deck, because his mind was elsewhere. Because on November 4th, Troy Williamson would not suit up with the Vikings, as instead of helping out the Vikings, he was busy helping out someone more important. He was helping out his family. On October 29th, Celestine Williamson died at the age of 72. Troy was incredibly close with his grandmother, as Celestine was an important figure in his life. As Troy said on his grandmother, This is a grandma I was always around growing up. She taught me pretty much everything I know, from cooking, to driving, to playing cards. I pretty much learned that from my grandma. It was very clear that Troy would not be the man he was without the guidance of his grandmother. And to emphasize just how much of a positive influence his grandmother was on him, Troy was not only attending her funeral, but was going the whole nine yards to honor her. He helped coordinate the whole thing, and paid for his relatives to fly from wherever they were and to Aiken, South Carolina, where the funeral was going to be held. Keep in mind that several Williamson's family members were in the military, so there was international travel involved in all of this as well. This was not just to show up, pay your respects, and leave kind of thing. Troy was practically running the funeral. And if that wasn't tragic enough for him to lose his grandma, he was also dealing with his older brother, Carlton, who was involved in an accident a few months ago in September, and was in and out of a coma. He was paralyzed after the accident. Troy was extremely close to his brother, as Carlton was there front and center when Troy got drafted. As Carlton said on that moment where Troy got drafted, having everybody here for this is the best part of it. Something good. Something historic for the family. A lot of today really was about the family. So on top of dealing with the death of his grandma, he was dealing with his brother fighting for his life. Williamson left the Vikings when he found out about his grandmother's death and returned to the team a week later after taking care of the funeral arrangements and his family's grief and travel plans. Considering how close he was to his family, that is just a horrible situation all the way around that is tough for anyone to go through, and it is a perfectly valid reason for missing work. Some things are more important than football, and family is one of them, especially if it's the right family that you're close to, as Troy was with his. So how was Williamson greeted after he returned to the Vikings one week later? He was met with a $25,000 fine. I'm not kidding. Head coach Brad Childress decided for some reason to find Troy Williamson for missing the Chargers game. As children said on this decision, it's really kind of out of my realm. It's a business principle organizationally. If you don't show up, how does that work? Childress then added the fact that Williamson's absence was excused had nothing to do with anything, as there was precedent for players returning quickly after having family members die. So why couldn't Williamson? He cited Vikings defensive tackle Pat Williams not missing any games in 2005 after his father died, cited Colts wide receiver Reggie Wayne not missing any games in 2006 after his brother died, and likely looked at other games, like when Brett Favre played after his father died, when Gary Danielson played after his newborn baby died, and when Len Dawson played after his father died. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Obviously, this position by Childress completely ignores the fact that everyone grieves differently, and ignores the fact that circumstances are different, as I'm not sure how many players who had a close family member die during the season had to plan the funeral and plan everyone's travel, and had to deal with another family member who was paralyzed and was in a coma at the same exact time. Understandably, Williamson was absolutely furious about this. To fine him over $25,000 for having the audacity to grieve and attend a funeral just seemed absurd to him. As Williamson said on the whole ordeal, 
I know it's a business. I know the Vikings have got other obligations when it comes to them and their families also. I know how I feel toward mine. He then added that Childress could have docked him his whole salary, and it wouldn't have mattered, because he was going to be with his family no matter what. Williamson said, No matter what Childress would have said, if I had to stay up here or not, I would have been out my house in South Carolina for that week. This is something I couldn't put on the back burner. It's really been hard for me. I was glad to go home and see my family. It was something that really helped me. The amazing part about all of this is that usually with football, you can find someone somewhere to take a stance on just about anything, no matter how wrong or how controversial it is. However, I dug high and low, and literally could not find one article saying that Childress made the right call by finding Williamson for attending his grandmother's funeral. This decision was universally panned by everyone. Even those who hated Williamson because of his lack of production on the field knew to separate the on-field production from the off-field realities of death, and knew that Childress was going way too far here and was completely out of bounds. One writer praised Williamson for his decision to prioritize his family, and called the Vikings organization a Grinch for doing this. Another writer said that fans should send dead fishes to the Vikings facilities for their treatment of Williamson. And fortunately, this universal backlash caused Childress to backtrack on those plans and retract the fine just a few days later. Perhaps it wasn't just the universal public backlash, but rather the fact that veterans on the team came to Childress personally and basically said, what the heck are you thinking? We don't know what exactly was said in that conversation, but the players probably said something along the lines of, good luck getting any free agents to come here and good luck getting any players to respect you or come to you with their problems if you're finding people for attending funerals. And it's not even like Williamson was going to keep the money. He had no intentions of keeping the $25,000 docked from his salary for attending his grandmother's funeral, as he donated it to a charity to honor her. Fortunately, Childress made the right call in the end, even if he took a completely roundabout way to get there. As Childress said, in a moment that feels straight out of an episode of South Park where Stan is preaching a lesson, I think the important thing is that everybody grieves differently. That's the thing that I learned, or we learned, in this. In the end, it's not important to be right, but to get it right. Williamson said that he wanted the issue to be over with, and that he wanted to put this matter behind him so he could focus on playing football. But that statement was issued by his agent, and not from Williamson himself. Because Williamson's true thoughts were much worse than that. Much, much worse. Williamson never moved on from this incident. He never respected Childress again, and hated his guts. And he hated his guts so much that in 2008, when Williamson was on the Jacksonville Jaguars and was getting ready to play the Vikings, Williamson had nothing but negative things to say about Childress. In fact, he hated Childress so much that he openly wanted to fight him. He was not kidding. He legitimately wanted to duke it out with his former coach, who tried to find him for going to a funeral. As Williamson said on the incident, we can meet on the 50-yard line, and we can go at it. After that fine, I had no more respect for Childress. That's gone out the window. I don't see it coming back ever. That bridge is burned. It just got so bad. I knew it was time for me to go. It was just a bunch of personal stuff on my end that he wouldn't let me handle. And keep in mind that Williamson wasn't even going to play in this game. He was dealing with a hamstring injury, so he was going to be out but he wanted to make it very clear that he hated Brad Childress's guts and wanted to fight him. The fight never materialized, but if it did, it probably would have been better than the game, seeing as the Jaguars were down 14-0 after the first 90 seconds. But any time a fine is so controversial that it makes a player want to fight a coach more than a year after the fact, even though the fine got rescinded and it was never finalized, that's when you know you messed up badly. Look, Troy Williamson's NFL career was horrible, he was a massive bust, and I don't think any of us are going to pretend otherwise. But life is more than football and more than what you do on the field. And for Brad Childress to do what he did to Troy Williamson is mind-bogglingly stupid and insensitive. If a player is close with two of their family members, and one of them is dead, and the other one is in and out of a coma where he'll likely never be able to walk again afterwards, for goodness sakes, let the man grieve and let him take care of what he has to do especially if it's only for a few days. We've seen players get fined for all sorts of reasons, with some of them being incredibly valid, like fighting in practice 
or showing up late unexcused or missing practice unexcused. But to find a guy for attending and planning out his family member's funeral? That's another level of absurd. Because after this horrible initial decision, a lot of people were saying rest in peace to any legitimacy and credibility that Brad Childress still had left. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gator 9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.